All right, we are going to get started. Um, welcome everyone, I'm Rachel Sandberg and I lead the library's Office of Scholarly Communication Services. Um, we help scholars navigate publishing, intellectual property and information policy in their research, scholarship and instruction. I'm joined today by my colleague, Tim Ballmer, our scholarly communication and copyright librarian. This workshop is sponsored by our office as part of the library's digital publishing workshop series. Um, and you may already see that we're recording this presentation because we're going to put it on our YouTube site and we will send around a link to the recording and to all of our slides and a transcript. Um, but we're not going to record the question and answer session at the end in order to encourage free discussion. Ask us anything you want. Um, feel free to feel free to put your questions in the Zoom chat along the way or save them until the end. We'll have plenty of time to talk. Next slide. So today we're going to focus on copyright, fair use, and other law and policy considerations that are important to understand as you build and eventually release your projects into the world. It's gonna help us provide you with really responsive examples in real time. Um, if we know a little bit more about the, the digital projects that you're working on or that you hope to work on. So we want this presentation to be as much about you as possible. And for that reason, we'd love for you to share something about your work in the Zoom chat if you're up for it. And we'll try to incorporate that into the examples we give along the way. Generally speaking, um, to highlight the principles we're discussing, we're going to be using as an illustrative scenario, the creation of a digital project in which you're tracking and documenting police misconduct in California. Next slide. So imagine that you are gathering content to use in your digital project and also creating your own database, charts, and scholarship for the project too. We know that digital projects can contain a wealth of different types of materials, including text, multimedia, images, maps, data sets, other kinds of resources, you name it. And you've done your research homework and found all of these materials from a number of different sources. So you've found content through databases, through scholarly articles, news websites, social media platforms, photo archives, and more. Next slide. With all of this content that you've collected as you're preparing to create a digital project and share it with the world, you'll need to consider two things. First, if you're using content created by other people, such as the materials I've just described, you'll need to consider whether you need permission to include and share that content online and distribute it in your project. Answering that question relies on various legal considerations that we're gonna go over, including copyright law. For instance, you'll need to understand the difference between using this graph for which you don't need permission, because as we'll learn today, this diagram is not protected by copyright and the next situation. Next slide. Which are examples of infographics and photographs that are protected by copyright because they reflect original expression, unlike that graph that we just looked at. And so for these, you would need to make a decision before publishing them about whether or not your use fits into an exception to copyright law or whether or not you need permission to use these materials. Next slide. Now for some of you, perhaps you're excerpting text from scholarly or other creative works in your project. Today, we're gonna to help you understand the difference between the text on the left and an excerpt, which is an excerpt from Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, and which is in the public domain and for which you don't need permission to include it because it's so old that it's not protected by copyright anymore. And the excerpt on the right, which is a modern translation of that text. We'll learn today why there is copyright in the new translation of that text, because it's a derivative work, so that the translation on the right is protected and you would need to make a determination of whether your use falls into an exception or if whether you need permission to include it. Next slide. We're also going to talk about what it means to actually get permission and when permission is already applied in advance through a license. 
So for instance, that modern translation we just looked at on the previous slide is already licensed for us to be able to, to use, meaning even though it's protected by copyright, we don't have to worry about whether we fit into an exception because the rights holder has already told us we can make use of the text in the way that we want to. Next slide. Okay, second, you're going to need to consider your own rights as an author of your project and think about how and whether you want to share your project in a way that encourages uses by others. That's because under US copyright law and depending on your employment or other status within the UC system wide policy, you may hold copyright to the digital projects you create. Generally speaking, the rule is that employees typically don't hold copyright if they create the, the project in the course of their employment. But you see students do hold copyright in what they create and faculty and lecturers and the like also hold copyright over their scholarly and aesthetic works. So as we'll see later today, you'll wanna think about if you own your copyright and if so, how you wanna manage that copyright. Like, should you register it? Do you wanna license certain uses for others, etc. Next slide. Don't worry about anything I've said so far. It was just to orient you to everything. We're gonna teach you a workflow and we might meet my cat. Um, we're gonna teach you a workflow that helps you answer all of these questions and more. But before we can do that, we need to understand some basics about copyright law, which is the key driver here for rights regarding your digital project and your rights as an author. Next slide. At the most basic level, this framing requires us to understand that simply attributing the author does not mean that we have the right to publish or distribute their content to others. Attribution is something we do as a matter of scholarly and professional practice. But whether we can actually distribute or include the content to begin with is instead based on whether we hold the copyright. And if not, whether we have some form of permission, either because the law says we do through an exception or because the person who does hold copyright has granted us a gift in the form of a license. So to provide you with the basics about copyright, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Tim. Thanks, Rachel. So what actually is copyright? Um, so at its core, copyright's relatively simple. So Congress created a collection of statutes to effectuate a provision of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. And that provision in the Constitution authorized Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. And they need science broadly here to include all sorts of scientific, scholarly, and other creative endeavors. So basically the drafters of the constitution wanted to develop an incentive for artists to create things. And we know that we as a society all benefit if people can build on the discoveries that came before them while having the incentive to create new things themselves. So Congress was authorized to give artists some protection in their creations. And the way they did this was to grant exclusive rights to control the fruits of their creativity. And these exclusive rights operate as an incentive to create things in the first place. But Congress shouldn't give artists those rights indefinitely because protection that lasts forever would actually cut against reuse and building on the works that came before. And this would actually hamper the progress of science and the arts. So it's important to be aware of the origins of copyright because sometimes we tend to think of it as a blocker for creative expression when actually it's designed to do the opposite. Let's take a look at what these exclusive rights actually are. So the Copyright Act defines five exclusive rights. So what does that mean? Let's say I'm the creator of this photograph on the slide. Um, if I'm the creator, I have the rights to reproduction, meaning I have the right to make copies of the photo. I have derivative rights, meaning that I can adapt the photo into another format, such as edit it and use it as a movie poster. I have the right of distribution, meaning I can pass out copies of the photograph. I have public performance rights, meaning I can perform the photograph in some way and charge admission. Now, you can see this doesn't necessarily work very well for photos, but you can imagine if this were a book or a script, 
and how I have public performance rights in that. And then the final one is public display, meaning I have the right to put this photo on display in a public space. And the copyright holder holds these rights exclusively, meaning no one else can do any of those five things. But notice what isn't a protected exclusive right, directing someone to a lawfully distributed or displayed copy. You're not invoking any of the exclusive rights by providing links to lawfully uploaded content. That's why you never even have to worry that you're infringing copyright if what you're doing is linking to a lawfully posted or distributed version of a work. Okay, so we said the carrot and stick balance with copyright is that the exclusive rights are granted only for a limited period of time in order to incentivize the creation of more works. And the duration of copyright can vary, but in the United States, it's typically at least 70 years after when the author dies. So life of the author plus an additional 70 years. And what does this mean? It means that within this protected time period, you need the copyright owner's permission to exercise any of those five exclusive rights that we just talked about. So to recap what we've just gone over, copyright is meant to encourage both the creation and use of creative works by giving authors exclusive rights to certain things for a limited period of time. Now, you might be thinking, but that limited period of time of at least 70 years after an author dies is really long. So how is anyone supposed to be able to use anything if the exclusive rights last for so long? Well, first of all, there are some crucial limitations on what copyright covers. And this is important because not everything that authors create is subject to protection under the Copyright Act. First, copyright only protects expression, not ideas and not facts. You can't copyright a fact or a statistic or a method. Now, obviously you should still be citing your sources if you're doing something like using a statistic because you need to conform to best practices for the scholarship, but you don't need to ask permission to use it. For example, here's a simple graph created by a researcher that graphs over time the count of unarmed victims of lethal force by the police. There's nothing in, about this graph or the underlying data that is protectable by copyright. Data are facts and a line graph has no original expression. You know, there are only so many ways that you can show the change in police killings as a function of time on a graph. Second, for a work to receive copyright protection, it must be original, authored, and fixed. Now, in terms of originality, there must be some minimal degree of creativity that is expressed. Now, courts have found that a phone book doesn't receive copyright protection because there's not the requisite level of creativity in just listing numbers next to names. Uh, also, a work must be authored by a person Works created by artificial intelligence don't get copyright protection, nor do works created by animals. Finally, the original expression must be fixed in a tangible medium, which means that it must be perceptible in form by a person or a computer. There is no copyright in anything until the expression is captured in something or reduced to writing. Here with this police photo, there's copyright in the photo because the photographer captured and recorded the image on film or on an SD card. There's another category of work that isn't protected by copyright, and that is work that's in the public domain. Now, if something is in the public domain, it is also available for use with no permission required. But we need to be a little bit careful here. Just because something is online, does not necessarily mean it's in the public domain. There are instead two types of works that are in the public domain. First, US federal government works are in the public domain because they're not eligible for copyright protection. This means that you can use something like a federal government publication 
without having to obtain permission to use it. Now, of course, you should still cite your sources. Uh, public domain for US government works only applies to federal government works. State government and foreign government works might be different. Not all US state government works are protected by copyright, but some can be, and it varies by state. So the second category of works that are in the public domain are works that were originally protected by copyright, but for which the copyright has now expired. So take, for example, this history of police in England. It was published in 1905, and we know that it's not, it's in the public domain because the copyright has expired. So right now for works published in the US, everything that was published prior to 1925 is in the public domain. And we know that for more recent works, copyright will expire seven years after the death of the author. Okay, so Tim helped us understand what is protected by copyright and what isn't. And we've said that if something is protected by copyright, then the copyright owner has those five exclusive rights for a long time. That means if we want to exercise one of those rights, like reproducing materials and distributing them in our digital project, we need the copyright holder's permission. Except, next slide. Except we don't need the copyright owner's permission if our intended use of the copyright protected work falls into an exception like fair use. So let's understand fair use. Fair use is an exception built into the Copyright Act that Congress included specifically to help encourage and protect criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Congress wanted to encourage this type of idea exchange. So in section 107 of the Copyright Act, they provided for the following. The fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. Great. So making a fair use for those stated laudatory scholarly purposes is not a copyright infringement. But how do we determine whether our use qualifies as a fair use? So for this, Congress set forth four factors that a court can balance in determining whether a use is fair. Let's explore these four factors in the context of incorporating a copyrighted work into our digital project. Imagine that our digital project on police violence is documenting the increased usage of explosives or tear gas by police against protesters. We're collecting text and images from newspapers and other sources over time in order to analyze the prevalence of different types of equipment being used by the police. Factor one of the balancing test asks us to look at the purpose and character of our intended use. Nonprofit educational uses are more likely to be considered fair than commercial uses. But increasingly, what a court will look to under this factor is whether our use is transformative. That is, are you planning on using the work in a different way or for a different purpose than the original creator? Or alternatively, are you adding new insights or understandings to the work? Well, in this case, we don't know exactly what the artist or photographer's purpose was in taking the photo. It might have been to document the mood of the protests. But keep in mind, we're using it to analyze the specific equipment that police are using. So if you use the photo to either comment on information contained within it, like what equipment police are using, or to closely analyze and critique or discuss it, you have transformed the intent of the photo from documenting or evoking a feeling to adding new sight, insights or understandings. Combined with the fact that you're also likely making use in a nonprofit educational context, factor one leans in our favor here. Factor two of the balancing test addresses the nature of the copyrighted work. For this factor, a use is more likely to be fair if you're using a factual or scholarly work rather than a more creative work. But the good news is courts hate dealing with this factor because they don't really wanna be in the business of determining how artistic or creative a work is. 
So factor two is not usually very consequential in the overall balancing test. But in any case, let's acknowledge that factor two here leans against us because this is in fact a creative work. But remember, fair use is a balancing test and any one factor weighing against us is not dispositive of overall fairness. So we turn to factor three. Factor three considers how much of the original are you planning on using? And how important is the portion you're using to the overall work? Despite what you may have heard anecdotally, there is no set percentage that's okay to use, like 10%, that's not a thing. Nor is there any set portion that's too much to use. You could only use a small portion, but if it's the most crucial portion, that could weigh against fair use. And in other cases, you may need to use the entire thing and that won't weigh against fair use because you actually need the whole thing to make your point. So what's important for this factor is actually using an amount of the work that's narrowly tailored to your new purpose. In our case here, we don't actually need to use parts of the photo outside of what's on the bodies of the two police officers. Technically, we don't need the ground or all of the fog, so we could consider cropping this photo to include it and make a better fit for fair use. If we do decide to use the whole photo, this factor could weigh slightly against us unless we can reasonably argue that the background is needed for context. Okay, finally, factor four. Factor four looks at whether your use would supplant the market for the original. That is, would somebody in your shoes otherwise need to purchase or license the work? If there is no ready licensing market for the photo and we're just using a low res photo that isn't going to supplant licenses of a high quality version anyway, in other words, someone would still need to license from the rights holder um, if they want a nice version of this photo, then we're not supplanting the market for the original. So factor four weighs in our favor. So overall, we've seen that here we're strong on factors one and four and moderate on factor three. Our use of this photo on balance for the purpose of real discussion and analysis um, would likely be a fair use. But you can see the difference in what the result would be if we weren't really going to discuss or transform understanding of the photo much under factor one. The more we transform, in our case, looking at it for information about what uh, equipment police are using, the stronger our factor one is for us and the stronger our fair use argument is. You never really know if you made the right determination until a court has to decide. In an academic context though, courts typically focus mostly on the first and fourth factors. The purpose and character of your use for which they often ask is your use transformative and your effect upon the market for the original. No matter what, remember it's going to be a balancing test. There's no bright line no formula you can apply, but also keep in mind that the fair use exception is purposefully broad and flexible in order to promote academic freedom, expression, education, and debate. Next slide. So we've now gone over just about everything you need to know about copyright law to move forward with your project. I promise you now have all of the understanding of copyright and important exceptions that you need. You are experts. With that expertise in hand, we can turn now to the workflow we created so that you can methodically answer law and policy questions for whatever your digital project is. Here's where you're going to see that we tricked you. We said this was a workshop on copyright, but in step three of our workflow, we'll see that there are a few other non-copyright legal issues you need to think about too. Don't worry, you will become experts in those too, so let's get going. Okay. In the first step of this workflow, which by the way is available on our website, um, we need to determine whether or not we need permission to use other people's content. That means asking three things. One, is the content protected by copyright? We now know how to answer that. We know what copyright does and does not protect, and we know for how long it protects things. Two, if it is protected by copyright, has a license already been granted? Remember, if a license has already been granted, then we don't need permission. And three, if the content is protected by copyright, but we don't currently have a license, then we consider whether we fit into some exception like fair use. And as you know, if our use is fair, then we don't need permission and we can skip step two and proceed to step three. 
So let's test this out. Remember, question one is, do we need permission? And there are those three things we ask ourselves to answer the question. First, is this protected by copyright? Let's say in our digital project on police misconduct, we'd like to include a futuristic French illustration of police, which was drawn in 1910. If you're up for it, please indicate in the chat window whether you think this painting is protected by copyright. Great, so we've already seen a few folks say, no, it's not. And the reason why is because it's in the public domain. It is no longer protected by copyright. It's too old to be protected by copyright. Not anymore, exactly. All right, what if I told you this was a scan made by the Getty Museum and they made the scan in 2005? Now give it a gander in the chat window whether you think Getty would have copyright in a 2005 exact duplication. <laughs> you guys are the best. <laughs> um, so everyone has said no question mark. Um, and the answer is no. Remember that copyright protects original expression. There is no original expression in an exact duplication or digitization of a public domain work, even if you invest effort or money in making the duplication. Now, you can control people's ability to use whatever you've scanned or in order to recover your investment or just because you're mean. Um, but that's not through copyright. That's through contract. And it's merely because you have or hold the digital object, not the intellectual property. We're going to look more at that in step three. OK, contrast this situation on this slide of the Getty making an exact replica of a pu public domain work with that 1992 crime and punishment translation um, that we looked at earlier. In a modern translation, there is original expression. And so there is copyright in the new translation, even if the original book is in the public domain. And that is true, Jennifer, we do not like mean people in our libraries, if only there were a better way of gatekeeping that. Okay, um, so unfortunately, to, to pick up on Jennifer's point, um, we see cultural heritage institutions all the time improperly assert copyright over public domain reproductions. It was documented on Twitter just a few weeks ago. Uh, you may be familiar with the how it started meme. Someone made one specifically about the co-opting of the public domain in which a publisher is claiming that its replica of Van Eyck is protected by copyright. Now, to give them the benefit of the doubt, sometimes publishers or cultural heritage institutions just don't understand that you can't restore copyright in an exact replica of the original, but they put copyright watermarks on it anyway. Now, someone who's taken the time to digitize the image can decide who gets to use the digital copy and under what conditions, but that's on contract, on a contract basis and not a copyright basis. And you can be aware of this and push back. Okay. But back to our workflow. So remember, we're asking ourselves in step one, do we need permission? And the first question we asked is, is it protected by copyright? If it is protected by copyright, then we have to ask, is there already a license that would allow us to make use of the work in the way we want to? So take a moment to indicate in the chat here whether or not you need permission to include this image from a defund the police event in New York in your digital project. In this case, no, we don't need permission. Exactly, Javier. We don't need permission, but we do have to, um, we do have to attribute the author. Here, the creator, and that's just because of, of good scholarly practices, but we don't need permission because the creator has already given us permission by putting a Creative Commons license on it that allows us to make use of the work in the way that we want to. Okay. Third and last question we ask ourselves for step one is, if it's protected by copyright and it doesn't have a license, 
then do we fit into an exception like fair use? So imagine here that our digital project includes analyzing Alex Vitale's work on police reform. And you'd like to excerpt a paragraph from a book to include in, in the digital project. Do we need permission of the copyright owner, which in this case is the publisher? Indicate in your chat, in the chat, um, what you think about fair use and why. So Jennifer's onto something here. We need a little bit of more information about how we're using this. So let's dig in here. Factor one asks us to consider what is the nature or purpose for which we're using this. If our project is nonprofit educational and we're using this content in a way that transforms it by adding new insights or understandings to the work through our commentary in our digital project, then we have made a, a transformation of the work and fac factor one would lean in our favor. Factor two, the nature of the work. Yes, this is a creative work which weighs against us, but remember that's just one factor, not heavily weighted by, by the courts. Factor three, how much are we using? One paragraph out of a nearly 300 page book is not very significant. Factor three weighs very strongly in our favor. And finally, factor four, are we supplanting the market for the original? There is no way. You'd be hard pressed to convince me that including a single paragraph from Vitaly's book would kill the market for people want, who need to buy the book and, and because they want to read the rest. So on balance, factors one, three, and four are very strong and using this paragraph is fair use. Therefore, we do not need permission under step one and we could skip to step three. Okay. The second step of the workflow is about how to actually obtain permission if you had determined under step one that it's needed. And step two is laborious. You'll need to figure out who actually holds the copyright, send them a request, make sure that what you request covers all the things you need it to do and keep records for your files. I'm gonna to touch on each of these very briefly. Next slide. It's not always easy to figure out who owns copyright for a work. If you're talking about something like a journal article or a book, you'll see a copyright symbol followed by the name of the entity like a publisher or the person who holds the copyright. If you don't see copyright information though, that doesn't mean it's not protected by copyright. Under modern copyright law, you don't need a copyright symbol. Publishers and authors are the folks to reach out to for more information because even if they've later transferred their copyright to someone else, they'd be able to identify that for you. For works published in certain years, copyright status depends on whether the work was registered with the Copyright Office and then subsequently had its registration renewed. So one place you could go to check on all of that would be copyright.gov, but they only have records from 1976 to the present. And typically you'd also only be able to find initial registrations. If someone later transferred their copyright to someone else, they might not have registered their transfer. If you're still looking for whoever holds the copyright, there are other resources you could try. For instance, there's something called WATCH and FOB. Writers, Artists, and Their Copyright Holders, or WATCH, is a database of copyright contacts for writers, artists, and prominent figures in creative fields. FOB is Firms Out of Business, and that's a database with information about vanished publishing entities or literary agencies that have gone defunct. You might think that, screw it, I'll just contact the library or archives where, where you found the material um, as the best place for information about who holds the copyright. But in reality, libraries and archives hold very little information about the copyright ownership of the materials in their collections. Now, the point of sharing all of this is not to scare you, it's just to show you that the process of finding rights holders and obtaining permission from them takes time. You may hit a few dead ends um, before you luck out. So you're gonna need to plan in advance and be prepared not to hear back. 
Now, the rights holder silence is not consent. So if you don't hear back, you don't expressly have permission to move forward. However, your efforts at obtaining permission show your good faith and should preclude the imposition of statutory damages if for some reason your use is ever challenged. I also want to flag the situation when a rights holder does reply and the response is no. How can you proceed? Well, just because they say no doesn't mean you can't move forward and use the material. Remember that you always have a fair use right. So even if you get a denial of your request, you can choose to still proceed under fair use if you can make a good fair use case. Just make sure that you really transform the material under factor one so you have a strong argument. Finally, we recommend keeping track of your request efforts, especially if you're trying to clear rights for a lot of different items. Keep the emails, put them into a digital or print folder, keep copies of everything, because as I said before, it'll be evidence of your good faith and should discourage any punitive damages if this ever does go to court. Next slide. So we build this workshop as being about copyright and digital projects, but as Rachel mentioned, there are actually other non-copyright law and policy consideration that you've got to make too when you're creating your digital projects. Um, and we treat these in step three of the workflow and essentially they boil down to contracts, privacy and ethics. And I'll talk about each of these uh, next. So we'll talk about what you need to know about contracts first. Um, these are mainly three kinds of agreements that affect your digital project and that you should know about. Uh, and those include database licenses, website terms of use, um, and also archives agreements. So let's start with databases. Uh, let's say you'd like to use data sets related to misconduct by police that you downloaded from say a library database. Um, since you know a bit about copyright now, you know that this is likely to be fair use if you work with the copyrighted data sets to provide new insights or analysis. But there's one catch, which is that database agreements that libraries sign can affect researchers' ability to republish by restricting recirculation of the contents even for uses that would otherwise constitute a fair use. And sometimes agreements with certain types of resources would provide only for access and limited use of the materials, not republishing. Um, and if scholars are accessing materials from library databases, our database agreement applies to them, even if the scholars didn't sign anything themselves. Making matters more challenging is the fact that researchers can have a difficult time finding the terms of our database agreements as the agreement we've signed are typically different from any public version that's viewable say on the publisher's website but the good news is that the uc signs database agreements that preserve fair use so in many cases if your project is just excerpting some content from what you download from our databases you should be okay because we've signed agreements saying it's okay to make fair uses. Uh, but where you might face issues is if your research methodology involves text data mining. Those are trickier agreements with more complicated language. And we actually teach an entire session on this. And you can also check out um, these resources in our online videos. But in any case, for the most part, our database agreements shouldn't be a problem for you to excerpt limited content in a scholarly digital project. However, if you're getting content from online sources that are outside of the library's databases, then there's a greater chance you'll need to think about whether you can include portions in your project under the website's terms of use. Again, this is separate from copyright. We already know your use might be fair, but there is now a layer of contract on top of that via a website's terms. And these terms of use could circumscribe rights that you would otherwise have had under copyright law. So here on the screen, we're looking at one from the Harry Ransom Center at UT Austin. 
These terms indicate that users must ask per them for permission to reproduce images, even if doing so would constitute fair use. So website terms of use are considered what are called browse wrap agreements, meaning that users consent to them simply by, by browsing the website. Browse wrap agreements are not always enforceable by a court. So contract issues are questions of state law rather than federal law. And courts in different jurisdictions may require that users have either actual or constructive notice of these terms. And this type of notice means that a reasonable person should have been made aware of the terms based on how the website was presented to them. Uh, and also constructive notice courts will look to things like how visible the terms of service were and whether the users were actually asked to consent to them. So what should you be aware of as a researcher? You should be aware that these terms may exist and you should make risk calculations accordingly. Often, if you are just accessing publicly available content, it could potentially be a low risk to violate the terms because it may be hard for the content owner to actually prove damages. In other words, what did the website's owner suffer if their publicly available content was used in a digital project? But of course, that doesn't mean that they won't try to sue you. But also remember, we're just talking about contract claims here. You could still be on the hook for copyright infringement if your use is not a fair use. Finally, you may be asked to sign agreements with archives or museums that hold the collection of materials you're seeking to use. Here we see an archives agreement that requires library permission to use any materials from the archives, even if we know it would be fair use under copyright law to do so. And even if the library or archive is not the copyright holder to begin with, the researcher here is then required to contact the copyright holder to ask for permission, even if it would have been a fair use here to publish. So this puts researchers in a position of having to ask permission of the library and the copyright holder, when in both cases, it could be a fair use. This is really a poor practice, but unfortunately that's how it works out for this case. But the good news is these agreements with memory institutions like libraries, they're often more negotiable than with commercial vendors like database providers. It's important to also understand certain things about privacy. So we have some great videos on what to know about privacy rights when you publish, but today we're just going to touch on a few of the key takeaways. Now, whereas copyright law protects the rights holders' interests in their works, privacy rights protect the interests of people who are the subjects of those works. Privacy rights arise most often if you are seeking to use third party primary source content, content like correspondence and diaries, um, also oral histories or pictures of particular people. Now there are a number of federal statutes that protect against the, the disclosure of various types of personal information. For example, FERPA covers student information and HIPAA covers health information. Now, in addition to these federal laws, there are also state laws governing privacy. And state privacy laws make certain intrusions a wrongful act. And there are four typical types of intrusions that state laws protect against. These are intrusion upon seclusion, the public disclosure of private facts, uh, painting someone in a false light, and appropriation of name or likeness. Now, we're not going to spend time going into detail about each of these. Instead, we want to make sure you're aware of important limitations on privacy rights that can really support your scholarship and publishing. The first limitation is that privacy rights expire at death, meaning you can't be liable for disclosing private facts about a person who's dead. Second, if the individual is not identifiable from the information or image that you're providing, 
there is no state law privacy violation. Third, if the material you wish to include reveals private facts that are newsworthy, then it could be okay to use them in your project. Newsworthiness means uh, if it's of public interest or concern, which your digital project may very well be. And the final limitation is when the person who is the subject of the information has given you permission to publish. If this is the case, then an invasion of privacy claim should not be sustainable. So let's go back to the police violence project. Say you're a researcher who gets a data set from a public record filing on police misconduct, such as court records that shows charges and convictions. Now you might want to use and republish the data set in your digital project. So from a privacy perspective, if the data is from public record filings, the entity that filed it should have done a privacy screening. However, sometimes private data is not properly filed. And if that's the case, then you shouldn't republish it. For instance, sometimes you can see health records or protected financial information that should have been redacted or filed under seal. And you could still violate privacy statutes by republishing that. Now, one way we can mitigate this is by screening for inappropriately filed personal information, things like social security numbers, uh, health or mental health conditions, or financial information. And if you do find any, you should decide whether to exclude the record, uh, to redact the personal information, um, or keep it as is depending on your comfort level and risk tolerance. But barring the inclusion of health, financial, social security numbers, et cetera, we really don't have a privacy concern here. These types of public documents fit into the relevant exceptions to state privacy torts. They are of public interest and are newsworthy. And further, they concern public figures and police as opposed to private citizens. Finally, the last consideration for step three is around ethics. So imagine for a moment your project contains information that could be harmful to people. While newsworthiness may be an exception to privacy law, you may still face ethical considerations. Let's again look at the police misconduct data set to review whether there are any ethical considerations in using and resharing it. Now, as we've discussed, there's likely no copyright, privacy, or contractual restrictions on rehosting the publicly filed court documents. Likely the main issue is one of ethics, which is not a legal issue, but you should consider it in the course of conducting ethical research and publishing. Some archives have decided not to collect or digitize criminal trial court records because they are uncomfortable with the idea that they might only have, say, charging documents, but not the follow-on materials. For example, if the charges were later dropped or if the person was acquitted. Similarly, with the police misconduct records, whatever we view in a docket right now might not tell the whole story. There might be other data that is not included, such as whether a particular case was dropped or settled, as we mentioned. Now, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to ethics and the digitization or publication of data. And what the UC Berkeley Library has adopted locally when we make decisions about what to put online are a set of balancing considerations. And at their core, these look at whether the value to researchers, to the public, or to cultural communities outweighs the potential harm or exploitation of people, of resources, or of knowledge. Now, if we were to apply our balancing principles to the police misconduct data set, our determination would weigh in favor of publication and of hosting this data set. Our balancing framework is just a suggestion. And for your individual projects, you should consider whatever values you want to uphold, as well as any relevant community or disciplinary standards 
that you're developing and publishing around your digital projects. And it's also a good idea to make these choices clear to your viewers and contributors to your project. Let them know about the ethical considerations in how they are using and repurposing the data, especially considering that it could be combined and displayed in ways that were not originally intended. Okay, we are almost there. Just one last step to think about as you ready your project for publication or sharing online. Two questions to ask yourself. Since you're now an author and probably a rights holder yourself, should you register your copyright? And second, do you want to add a license to your work that would allow other people to make uses of it beyond fair use? Unless some employment work for hire situation applies, uh, typically you hold your copyright. And you hold copyright the moment your original expression is fixed in a tangible medium, like typed on your computer screen. You don't need to do anything to own copyright, not anymore. You don't need to put a copyright symbol on it if you don't want to, and you don't need to register it with the US Copyright Office. But there are advantages of registering your copyright. It costs $45 and what it buys you is the ability to sue people. You cannot file a suit for infringement unless you register your copyright. And you can't be sued for infringement by someone unless they've registered their copyright. Infringement suits are very lucrative. Um, that's because there are statutorily prescribed damages that run anywhere between $750 and $30,000 per work and they're at the discretion of the court. Plaintiffs who can show willful infringement may be entitled to damages of up to $150,000 per work. And those statutory damages only start to accrue after registration occurs. So if you wait to register or the person trying to sue you waits to register, you or they could be missing out on some killer statutory damages to help offset exorbitant student loans. Okay. Now I've said the general rule is that employees typically don't hold copyright if they create the material in the course and scope of their employment. But you see students hold copyright in what they create and faculty and lecturers and the like also hold copyright over their scholarly and aesthetic works. There's an, a, a special policy we wanna let everyone know about if you're a university employee. If you are employed by the University of California, we want to make you aware of this policy applying to fair use. Now, it's not the law. We've already looked at the law. This is just a policy from the University of California that explains their position on the law and how it impacts you. Under a policy they issued in 2015, the UC stated that it wants to support fair use in teaching and research. So under this policy, if you're acting in the scope of your UC employment, and you can show that you've adopted an informed, reasonable and good faith approach to using copyright protected content, the university will defend you in a lawsuit. So good news, if you follow the guidelines we've talked about here, making informed and reasonable decisions, the university will defend you in work related lawsuits. You might still be sued and lose for infringement, but the university will at least take care of your defense. Receiving the university's legal defense is a good thing uh, because as I meant, as we just talked about, the, the damages can be pretty steep. Okay, the second thing we need to think about is do we want to license other people to use our, our work beyond fair use? Remember, we've talked a lot today about how you're relying on fair use of other people's work and they have a right to make fair uses of yours. The question is, do you want to apply a license to your work beyond what would constitute fair use in order to make it crystal clear to them what uses you allow? You may have seen various Creative Commons licenses on scholarly materials that expressly authorize such uses and take the guesswork out of what others are allowed to do with your, your work. Should you put one on, on yours? Well, the answer is you'll need to think about it and talk to your advisor, colleagues, Many of you might want to use portions of your digital project for downstream scholarship. So you might not wish to apply a license on it but for beyond fair use. You'll need to think about your long-term goals for the work. Okay, so we're turning to the last takeaway for today. 
where to go for more help. There are several code of best practices in fair use on a variety of creative topics and disciplines created by American University Center for Social Media. For example, they have guides on fair use in documentary filmmaking, fair use in for poetry, fair use in dance related materials, etc. These guides could be helpful in giving you a sense of how others within that field are approaching fair use questions and practices. But remember, um, there, there's no one is ever going to be able to, to, to say categorically whether or not a use is fair. Um, it's a balancing test in your particular situation. So that's why we're here. Um, we can help you. We have a website, we have YouTube videos, and we have Tim and me and, and other colleagues, um, our, our colleague Michael, for example, who can help you navigate copyright and publishing. So that is it. Um, we are going to, uh, Evan, if you could turn off the recording so that we can answer questions. Um, we will answer everything that you've got.